Good morning and welcome to our worship on this, the fifth Sunday of Easter. We share together in a service of morning prayer. As is our tradition, we acknowledge with respect that we worship on the traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam and the Squamish. Let us pray that we may live more deeply into the calls to action from Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. May the living Christ lead us all on pathways of reconciliation and peace. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us praise our God, who has given us life and hope by raising Jesus from the dead. Let us rejoice then, even in our distress. We shall be counted worthy when Christ appears. O God, you have claimed us as your own, and called us from our darkness into the light of your day. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord, Lord is, is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are you, God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As once you ransomed your people from Egypt and led them to freedom in the promised land. So now you have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the loving reign of the risen Christ. May we, the first fruits of your new creation, Rejoice in this new day that you have made, and praise you for your mighty acts. Blessed be God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever.
A reading from the Book of Acts. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he died. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 31, verses 1 to 5 and verses 15 and 16. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. Sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me. For you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and in your loving kindness save me. Glory to God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. 
the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. morning. As you might imagine, I felt drawn to speaking today about the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, one of the church's first deacons, the patron saint of deacons, and the church's first martyr. But when Philippa offered to help stage a reenactment, I thought perhaps I would turn my attention to the gospel reading instead. And in all good conscience, it would perhaps be remiss to neglect today's word from the Gospel of John. I find it ironic that this passage, which begins with Jesus saying, let not your hearts be troubled, has often itself been the cause of troubled hearts and minds. To some people, Jesus' statement, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, has provided direction comfort and reassurance. To others, it is a dismaying claim of exclusive access to God, a door slammed in the face of others in the world who understandably consider themselves also to be beloved of their Creator. At different times and in different places, this text has indeed been used more as a weapon of domination than a tool for outreach. So what truth do I draw from this passage? Well, I first remind myself that when Jesus is quoted as making such statements in the Gospels, he is generally taking issue with certain aspects of his own religious tradition, not attempting to stake a claim for a new, authoritative religion. His primary concern is not with doctrine, but with diakonia, that is, service to others. Just prior to this gospel passage, he told the disciples, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And to bring home the point, he washed their feet in a gesture of humble service to show them what love in action really looks like. Following Jesus in this manner, committing our lives to the well-being of others, is indeed the way, the truth, and the life, the doorway to a present and eternal kingdom of God and in God. I also remind myself that the by and large the gospel accounts are words about Jesus, not of Jesus. They were written some decades following his death and resurrection. They are a holy, spirit-filled testament to the oral histories handed down from Jesus' followers, to the passion and perspectives of the Gospel writers, to events that had taken place during Jesus' life but were seen in a new light following the resurrection stories, to the evolving spiritual understanding of the early church, and to the different pastoral needs and challenges being faced by fledgling church communities when these accounts were written. All of these aspects are at play in the New Testament writings, and all of them give glimpses into Christ's divine and ongoing mission. As individuals and as the Church, we are continually called to seek the truth woven into and behind these words of Scripture, not to get over-anxious about the exact terminology of any one verse. So I bring all of that to my understanding of this text. But this verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life, also reminds me that to some extent we humans need our way defined for us, a road that reassures us with familiar landmarks, a path we can trust, even if we don't always know what's behind the next bend. I have sometimes spoken with people who don't do religion because they consider God both universal and ultimately unknowable. They believe that embracing one particular narrative and rit ritual around God is somehow unsophisticated or perhaps arrogant. But I don't agree. 
To me, that's like saying that since love is such a universal, all-powerful emotion, it's foolish to get married. After all, one might say, how can committing yourself to one mortal partner fully express the inevitable enormity of love? Well, it probably can't. But at least through making this and other such commitments to spouses, to friends, to family, we participate in making the concept of love tangible. We learn what love feels like and what it calls us to do and be. We put legs on it. We can use our lives to transform love from a noun into a verb. Hopefully, in any kind of human relationship that has love at its center, we grow and we give, and we know where to go when times are hard. By choosing to follow the way of Jesus, we similarly return the concept of God into a tangible experience of God. Although we Anglicans often don't feel comfortable evangelizing, we know what a great blessing it is to be active in a community of faith, following a Christ who loves us and leads us into greater participation in a kingdom of justice, joy, and mercy. But there are people who don't have that kind of spirit at work in their lives, and we need to get better at encouraging their faith. After all, if you're walking along the sidewalk and someone pulls over in their car to say they've become lost on their way to the airport, you don't tell them, oh, don't worry, there are lots of roads to get there, you'll find one, and keep walking. No, we tell them how we get there. We think for a minute, we cast our eyes in the right direction, we point, we gesture, we write down a street name or two, and we make sure they've grasped the directions before we wander off again. In my family, Mom and Dad and I were each committed to our own particular route from Lynn Valley to Vancouver Airport. I could never understand Mum's strange path over 33rd and through Queen Elizabeth Park. Dad was wedded to Knight Street, and I was, and remain, passionate in my defense of the simplicity of going straight down Rupert and turning right on Marine Drive. I wonder if we Anglicans might learn to share our roadmap to God with as much enthusiasm as we offer up our way to the airport. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. So I invite you to sit with that verse in this Easter Eastertide week to come and think through what it means to you. If someone pulled over to the side of the road and instead of asking you directions to the airport, asked you to point the way to God, what would you say? How would you say it? And when that person pulled away from the curb and you began your walk home, would you think back on what you had told them and wonder if you, had, you were living the life you had described? It's one thing for us to believe in Christ Jesus. It is another to answer his call to service, compassion, and self-sacrifice. Every day invites us to live more boldly as people of the resurrection, to share our faith ever more confidently in word and in deed. So may God grant us the courage and commitment to claim the path of the risen Christ, our way, our truth, and our life. Amen. Amen. We share together in our affirmation of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. For the Church of the Living God in every
every place as we look for new ways of being community and agents of God's love in the world. Holy One, hear, hear us. us. For the search committee for our next rector, for the candidates, and for ourselves as we wait for the appointment to be made. Holy One, hear, hear us. For the planet and the complex web of life it sustains. Holy One, hear, hear us. For the leaders of the world as they make decisions affecting the health and well-being of the peoples of the world. Holy One, hear, hear us. For healthcare workers and researchers as they bring their energy and skills to overcome the virus. For all other essential workers. Holy One, hear, hear us. For people whose living conditions does not allow for physical distancing, in care homes, inner cities, refugee camps and jails, for people in remote areas who do not have ready access to medical care. Holy One, hear, hear us. For children, youth, and young adults whose hopes and plans have been disrupted by the suspension of normal activities. Holy One, hear, hear us. us. For people who have lost their source of income and those who are facing a return to working conditions that may be unsafe. Holy One, hear, hear us. us. For people living with anxiety, depression, fear, grief or loneliness, for people for whom home is not a safe place, and those who are far from home. Holy One, hear, hear us. us. For people who are sick, at home or in hospital, for those who are dying. Holy One, hear, hear us. us. We give thanks for all the blessings we receive. Holy One, hear us. We give thanks for the lives of people who have died, entrusting them to God's gracious care. Holy One, hear us. Holy One, we commit all these prayers to you, those we have spoken and those that remain unspoken. In the name of the risen Christ, amen. amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another and walk in the way of his commandments, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Rejoicing in God's new creation, and gathering our prayers and praises into one. Let us pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Alleluia, Alleluia. May the risen Christ grant us the joys of eternal life. Amen. Thank you.